food. Uh, as regents know from past experience uh, with these one-day meetings, we often take the opportunity to explore one or two topics in depth. Today we don't have a full afternoon available to do that, but we're going to at least scratch the surface of an important topic with a presentation about UW System's role in developing global leaders. I'm going to invite Associate Vice President uh, uh, Collison, Stephen, Stephen Collison to come and tell us about it. Stephen? Thank you. Thank you, Regent President Miller. Thank you, uh, President Cross. We are very pleased this afternoon to discuss <coughs> the subject international education in the University of Wisconsin system and the role of UW systems in developing global leaders. This is a continuation of our conversation in, Ju in June in Milwaukee on high impact practices. We know that high impact practices are practices that enriches student learning, also that leads to positive outcomes for students. And so international education is one of those high impact practices. My name is Stephen H. Collison, Jr. For those of you who don't know me, I have the privilege to serve this great institution as the Associate Vice President for Academic, Faculty, and Global Programs. I've served in this role for about seven years. Today, I'm very pleased to be the moderator for this session, and we have a few goals that we want to accomplish. First, we just want to share information with, with you about international education in the system. We want to discuss the importance of international education to our students. We also want to discuss the importance of being able to attract international students to our institutions and the contributions that they make to this great institution. Then we want to highlight a few examples of international programs and partnerships we have around the world. To do so, I'm going to be assisted by a distinguished panel that we have assembled here this afternoon to help deliver those goals. I will introduce the panel shortly. Before I introduce the panel, I would like to take a few moments just to give you an overview <coughs> at a system level of the work we are doing in international education. Let's begin with this question. Why is this subject important? Well, we know that through international education, we create greater awareness globally for our students, and we also help them to be very competitive in a global marketplace. Through international education, our students acquire different languages. They build leadership skills at a global level. There's personal growth. There's also citizen diplomacy, that students learn how to be diplomats. Sometimes you, you see governments cannot solve problems, and they are backdoor channels. Those backdoor channels sometimes are based on students who have personal relationships with other individuals in other countries, and most of the time they are very successful. The other importance of global uh, uh, international education is that it helps our students to be very competitive in the global marketplace for jobs. How do we deliver international education to our students? We use a number of means to accomplish that. But I'll just highlight just one. We build relationships in other countries, and we leverage, we leverage those relationships to give our students opportunities to study abroad, as well as to give our faculty to engage in some sort of a professional development. <coughs> Let me just point out to you that we have about 128 active agreements and partnerships all around the world. There are about 196 countries in the world, and so that's not a very, good, that's not, that's not a very bad place to be at 128. In fact, uh, if you don't count, say, uh, uh, Taiwan, then we have 195 countries. But for our purposes, we count 196. So I'm just trying to, to point out that at 128, we're doing pretty well. And those are active uh, partnerships. There could be more, but those are the ones that are active I want to point out to you. 
talking about study abroad, in 2013-14, we sent about 7,000 students to different places in the world. And study abroad is a very high impact practice as well. The, 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 the popular destination is Europe, obviously, uh, due to language, language, language issues. Um, and most of our students will go to United Kingdom, which, where, where they speak English, as you know. But United Kingdom, Spain, France, and Germany, those are the places that our students will, will go in, um, in Europe. In <coughs> Central and South America, our students will travel to Ecuador, Costa Rica, and Brazil. In the U.S. territories, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and some of the Pacific Islands. You also see that about 4.2 percent of our students travel to Australia and New Zealand. Again, there's an advantage for our students. Uh, English is the official language in those countries. Here in, uh, in, 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 in North America, Canada, and Mexico, uh, not many students um, uh, participate in those countries, something that I think we need to do something about. And then in the Middle East, uh, some of our students travel to the Middle East for study abroad, mostly in the country of Turkey. Turkey is a great, great, great partner with the United States and a member of NATO. So we can understand why many of our students will go uh, to Turkey in the Middle East. Talking about study abroad, I just want to introduce to you four students. I had a very special opportunity to visit a number of institutions in Germany about four years ago. And I was invited to visit Philips University Marlboro in, in, in Germany. This university is one of the oldest universities in the world. It was established in 1527. It was established as a Protestant university. And my host, the Vice President for Academic Affairs, uh, included on my itinerary to meet with certain individuals. I didn't know who they were. Um, of course, uh, these students were asked to show up at a particular time to meet somebody. They also did not know who they were going to meet. So I show up in this room, and then here were these four students. And so let me just, from left, uh, this, is, this is Daniel Franklin. Uh, at the time, he was a student at the University of Wisconsin Superior. Um, Carissa Mead, at the time, she was a student at the University of Wisconsin at Cross. And Tiller Gomez, he was a student at the time at the University of Wisconsin uh, Superior. And then Molly Ellen Bosky, she was a student at the time at the University of Wisconsin River Falls. I cannot, there are no words to describe this encounter. It was quite an exciting encounter. Um, there were long hawks. We were just so happy to see each other. Uh, it didn't matter, I was coming from the system office. It was as though I was one of the advisors on the campus. And we had a, we had a wonderful time together. I spent about an hour and a half talking with them just trying to find out from them how did they feel about the experience and how were they doing. They were very excited. They were doing very well in their classes. And they, they, they felt very pleased to have such an opportunity. At the end of our visit, I asked them, I said, do you have anything you'd like me to share with the folks back home? And they all said to me, we want you to tell our chancellors that we are doing very well. And we also want to encourage our chancellors to work very hard for these kinds of opportunities. We know that now our, our, our colleagues are able to participate in these kinds of opportunities. And if they can work very hard to make it more affordable, that would be a great thing. I remember coming back and, and contacting our dean, as well as Joe Gao. At the time, uh, Rene, at the time, uh, Chris Markwood was the interim chancellor, and I did contact Chris Markwood and, and deliver the message. By this time, I think these students are probably finished, and they are gone, uh, certainly. Uh, they look very promising. And so I just want to point that out to you, that when our students go abroad, there is personal growth, and it's very beneficial. Let's talk about inbound, students who come to our institutions. We have about 9,000 international students studying all across the system. About 60% of those students come from Asia, with China leading as, as, the, as, this, as the source of many of our international students. If you look at this map, 
you see that, uh, for example, from Mexico and Canada, we have only 2%. Uh, I think uh, this is right in our neighborhood. I think we could work to increase that number. I'm very much interested in having a much diverse uh, uh, student, international student body. Let's just take a look at a few numbers. Um, if you take the total student population in 2013-14 and, and do the calculation, it's only about 5%. Our international student number is number. And this is all students, graduate students and undergraduate students. If we look at our flagship in institution, it's only 13%. And I point this out because I'm about to show you something that is, it, to me, is, is very important. If you compare uh, our flagship with uh, some of SPS, you will see this is where University of Wisconsin-Madison is in terms of enrollment of international students. Here is the University of Illinois uh, Champaign, uh, over 10,000 students. But this graph will not tell you the entire message. So let me, let me move to the next graph, which I think is more interesting. In terms of percentages, we see that uh, Purdue University, by percentage, is about 24% of the entire student body is, in, is of international uh, students. And here we have University of Wisconsin-Madison is about 13%. The average for most of the institutions is about 16%, which means even our flagship is some is, is below just about 30, 30 percentage points. So I, I just want you to have that uh, in, in mind in terms of uh, uh, what, we, what we need to do in terms of recruiting uh, international students. Let us also look at the, the importance of international students at our institutions. Uh, in the state of Wisconsin, there are about 11,000 international students in the state of Wisconsin and they contribute about $300 million to our local economy. And that supports over 4,000 jobs. But more importantly, uh, these students, they bring global perspectives to our classrooms and to our lives. They contribute to innovations in science, technology, and engineering. They enrich our campuses culturally. Of course, there are always the issue about the out-of-state dollars the opportunity to attract more of those kinds of funds. So at this time, let me uh, introduce to you our panel who will go in more details on the role that we play in international programs. Um, first, I want to introduce to you Dr. Fernando Delgado, who is the provost. He's sitting right up front here on my, on my right the Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at the University of Wisconsin River Falls. And then uh, Dr. Patrice Petro, who is the Vice Provost for International Education at the University of uh, Wisconsin Milwaukee. Uh, she is accompanied by Gina uh, Greenwood, who might also contribute to the composition. Cynthia Williams, who is Dr. Cynthia Williams, who is the, the Director for International Relations in the Division of of International Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And also, uh, uh, Guido Pedesta is here, who is the Vice Provost for International Programs. Uh, we also contribute to the conversation. And then we have our distinguished student, Mr. Brian Williams, who is uh, a student at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Plaville, but he plays another uh, national role. He is the secretary for the private chapter of engineering, engineers with our border. So let me turn it over to the panel. Um, we know we, have a, we are tight on, on schedule, but we do our best to stay on schedule. So we begin first with um, uh, Fernando. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for the time. Um, my, my goal is to just simply talk about uh, UW River Falls and our outbound programs, our, our sending away programs, and the strategies, challenges, and opportunities we see therein. I'm told to stay within five to seven minutes. Those of you who know me, that's basically my introduction. Um, so I'll maybe going fast and covering some things. Um, UW River Falls has embedded at edu global education and engagement as goal two of our current strategic plan. We came to that not just because of a shared vision between our faculty and staff and administration, but we have that vision collectively because of a long history with education abroad, both inbound and outbound. 
For us, perhaps our history begins with Dr. Robert Bailey in the sociology department and the establishment of our quarter uh, semester abroad program, which began in 1963. It is now known as Semester Abroad Europe, a semester-long 12-week, 12 12-and-a-half-week 12 program. About the same time, we began discussing uh, interinstitutional uh, arrangements between us and universities, particularly those in Asia. Those have taken various forms and have matured, particularly since the 80s forward. So those opportunities that allow us to exchange students inbound and outbound include uh, the Zhejiang International Studies University, with whom we've had a partnership since the mid-1980s, uh, several universities in Taiwan, a couple universities in South Korea. We work through the state of Wisconsin and state of Hesse Hesse Exchange Program, which is hubbed out of the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh. Within that, we have a partnership relatively new with the Rhine Main Applied Universities, excuse me, University of Applied Sciences in Wiesbaden, a lovely spa town if you've ever visited. Um, a newer arrangement with, with both the government and the technical system, technical university system in Malaysia, hubbed in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, relationships in Mexico, those that are new, and those like with the University Autónoma de Guadalajara, which goes back to 1984. In addition to these university exchange programs, like most of our university siblings, we have long-term and short-term programs. Our short-term programs, which are guided by a system series policy under 7, 7.1 through 7.4, are cost recovery programs. So that gives us some flexibility on pricing and structure. It also means that we don't subsidize them. We may choose through scholarships or grants to subsidize the students, but the programs themselves are entrepreneurial. And it's our task then to work with the faculty to identify the best opportunities for them to leverage the kind of program they want to create, assure quality and relevance to the students, and more importantly, be sure about affordability. Our students are oftentimes amongst the most challenged financially in the system, and less than half of our students are beyond first-generation students. So there's a certain amount of developmental work. These uh, short-term programs will take the form of anywhere from two weeks to four weeks. They can occur at any time during the semester, including in the middle of the semester, certainly semester breaks uh, in March, January, and in May are also popular. Um, we also do modified programs. Uh, our primary modified island program is one that's done in a consortium with other UW schools. It's called the Wisconsin and Scotland program. It has been around for nearly 30 years. Uh, we find that it works quite well. Uh, as Stephen pointed out, Europe is a popular destination. For those of you who don't know, Edinburgh is in the northern part of the United Kingdom. Uh, a year ago, I might have said it was in the sovereign nation of Scotland, but it's still part of the United Kingdom. Um, and we find that it works well for our students, uh, particularly those that are, are challenged developmentally with the concept of going abroad, because it is both an abroad experience. You have to get a passport. You has, have to go through customs, singular experiences if you've never done those. Um, but it also provides a safe landing spot and hub that we manage. So all of the learning, if you will, and living occurs in one facility. And we bring students from other UW campuses, from a couple of campuses in, in the state of Minnesota, and we have burgeoning partnerships in Texas and Kentucky as well that send students. Um, it also can serve as a landing spot and a safety zone for our semester abroad Europe or international traveling classroom programs. Um, three years ago, we began something called Experience China. We figured since we had this long-standing relationship in China, we should leverage it to send students abroad for a semester. That has had its ups and downs. Um, as the economy has degraded for some of our students, that has become a challenge, um, as many of those long-term programs have been. Not because of the cost of the program, but because the students are leaving behind a job that they'll need the income for to help pay for tuition and living expenses when they return from their semester abroad. We also use third-party programs. Um, if you go to our university website, we highlight and refer students to many UW partner institutions. Um, through this year in particular, we have sent a lot of students through Platteville's Spanish language programs because we've had to cannibalize ours, um, ours as we've redeveloped a strategy there. Um, and then we do tend to focus on the four credit programs that are faculty-led, and uh, the latest inventory for the last 12 months include programs in Belize, China, Costa Rica, Germany, India, Italy, Japan, Nicaragua, Poland, South Korea, Taiwan, and Uganda, and I'm sure I missed one. Um, in addition, we also have short-term cultural, educational, and service learning trips. For example, 
uh, at least twice a year, uh, a group of artists will go to Chile and participate in a multinational artist colony that is led by one of our faculty, and he is joined by his colleagues at two universities and art, art centers in Santiago, Chile. Um, and we have um, people in our music and in our choral groups that take uh, either um, the whole group or subsets of the groups primarily to Taiwan and Korea for a week to 10 days to perform. What kinds of things do we consider? Well, first and foremost is optimized participation. It is part of our strategic plan to increase the total number of students going abroad, the proportional share who are engaging in long-term, semester-long study abroad, and to diversify the number and characteristics of our students who do go abroad. And that is informing how we see our new partnerships. We seek options that are cost sensitive. We know that our students will look at the sticker price of a study abroad opportunity and make decisions. And so we work closely with the faculty to come up with relevant itineraries that are useful, productive, um, and appropriate, but at the same time have that price sensitivity. We also work with the faculty directly through our International Programs Committee to assure that any, per, any for credit experience has rigor and quality. Many of these short-term courses are recurring courses that either are tied to an existing curricular course that is cataloged or more likely a special topics course. If it is a special topics course, it is reviewed both by our curriculum committee and our international programs committee before I sign off on it. We also have to work with those, that are with those options that are developmentally appropriate for our students. Why? Um, my wife grew up in a town in Iowa that still has 947 people. And thank God the Amish moved in or they'd be down to 700. She is the first person in her family that has ever traveled abroad. She's the first person in her immediate family that has ever had a passport. And when we explained to her, folks, when she was 27 years old, why she needed to come with me to Spain, because I was doing research there, and we told them that we were going to end up at a beach, her father's response was, well, we've got plenty of beaches in the United States. Why do you have to go there? And all we were asking for is, Mom, Dad, can you send the birth certificate so we can get, for your grown-up daughter who has a PhD, a passport? I refer back to that because that is a similar experience that many of our students have when they're trying to explain the cost and opportunity and the challenges with going abroad. So we have to work not only with the students, but oftentimes with the parents to help them understand the value in this opportunity. That's why the Wisconsin and Scotland program and the Semester Abroad Europe have worked so well, because they're so hubbed around our faculty. Everybody feels safe. And what we have learned is once they feel safe and put their toe in, they then want to get all the way up to their knees or their hips. And oftentimes, we'll have repeat travelers as a result of that. But that first hurdle developmentally can oftentimes be a huge hurdle. We also want to seek options that are consonant with academic and curricular goals. We don't want these programs to stop a student or slow a student from their graduation progress. And we have to work very hard to find appropriate partners. We have and are very proud of our College of Agriculture. It is oftentimes hard to find a suitable partner in a place that is consonant, safe, protected, and appropriate for our students that has a College of Agriculture. Now, our students will go pretty far. Um, we got a group that will go every other year with ag engineering to Bangalore, India. Mm -hmm. Now imagine an ag student coming back after three weeks in Bangalore, India, getting the questions and customs and immigration when they come back to the United States. Have you been around animals on foreign soil? <laughs> uh huh. What kinds of animals? Well, there was the yak running down the highway, but more importantly were the cows and the chickens and the turkeys that I worked with on the farm. And so. <clears throat> We understand that our students are going to go many different kinds of places, but we also understand that we have to prepare them and help them connect what their experiences are to what their academic goals are. We work very hard to secure philanthropic support for our students, and the Chancellor has led the Falcon Scholars Program. That is key because what it guarantees for those students who become a Falcon Scholar is $2,000 in their junior or senior year to subsidize either a semester abroad program or undergraduate research, or as we're finding as both activities mature, a fusion of the two. We also try to articulate education abroad as an important experience within the, within the construct of UWRF and the value we pre provide. We track our NESI data as part of our strategic plan every year. We focus on those co-curricular high-impact practices 
And what we've seen is particularly for our students, education abroad makes a huge positive impact. We identify education from the mo education abroad from the moment that they invest any time in looking at us on our web pages, on our, our student visit days, during our orientation sessions, that this is something we want for them and that we will work for them so that they can achieve these um, opportunities. As I said earlier, since 2012, Education Abroad, Global Engagement in Education, is part of our strategic plan. And in fact, it's probably that part of the strategic plan that we've had our most notable achievements. What do we have to do? Well, we have to prepare students. First, we've got to cue them to um, costs and timelines to prepare. Most students think all they've got to do is kind of get their driver's license, go downtown, submit some documents, and the next day their passport shows up. No, it costs a little bit more than that. It takes a little bit more time unless you really want to get expensive. We provide forms and information and on all the options to our students um, as they're thinking about them, certainly before they leave, and we do debrief when they come back. We provide a large amount of peer and professional advising from students who have done education abroad and from a large number of our faculty who are deeply, deeply committed to this. And then again, the departure seminars and workshops cover everything. Local customs, language, rules and regulations, embassies, everything that we need to do in order to assure a good and safe trip and return. What are the goals and outcomes of all of this? We want to connect students to the global reality irrespective of their degree program. As per our mission, we are there to help prepare students to be productive, ethical, creative, engaged citizens and le leaders with an informed global perspective. We target and track participation rates in short-term and long-term education abroad, cutting these by demographic characteristics of the students. We develop, refine, and assess programs for viability, fit, and strategic academic rel relevance every year. And education abroad is embedded in and connected to majors and degree programs, courses, and extracurricular activities such as internships and undergraduate research. And the truest evidence of this is one of our first billboards we put up when we started our new strategic plan, which says, student research on seven continents. Because we take two students every year with Professor Nath Madsen to Antarctica as part of the Ice Cube project. That's some of what we do with Education Abroad. Thanks for your time. Okay, well, you, you got two of us. Um, I'm Patrice Petra, Professor and Vice Provost for International Education at UWM. I'm here with my colleague Jennifer Grunewald, who is the Director of International Student and Scholar Services at UWM. And I was asked to talk about the international student experience at UWM, so I just wanted to tell you just a little bit, um, and I'll turn things over to Jennifer, and, and we're quick. Um, interesting, hopefully, but quick. Um, UWM currently enrolls over 1,600 international students from over 80 countries. Um, international uh, student enrollment has increased 71% since fall 2011 and 88% since fall of 2008. In other words, in 2008 we had 800 international students um, and with a majority of those being graduate students. Now we finally, in 2014, we have more international undergraduates than we do graduates, about a little more than 800 um, undergrads and a little fewer than 800 grads. And that's a, that's a significant change. So why did this happen? Well, part of it, it was a, a strategy on our part to grow our international student population, which is a still a very small 6-7% of the entire UWM population. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, certainly, as people have, have discussed, you know, they pay out-of-state tuition, there's revenue, but it isn't just that. I mean, I'm really proud to call UWM uh, home, where I've been almost 30 years, um, and 16 years in, in my role here uh, with international education. And, you know, it, it's a very diverse city and campus, and there's room to really expand that diversity, which I think is critical for all students' education. Um, one of the things that we've done is this growth in enrollment, you know, we, we really thought we have to be sure that we're doing our best job of taking care of these students and their special needs of these students. Um, some of the things we do, of course, we have, you know, we have a series of international welcomes and orientations. We have, we developed monthly how's it going. We have 
we had a culture cafe where international students and domestic students would get together once a month and to talk about their travels, their culture, and so we tried all. You know, these are kind of best practices in this in this area. Um, but one other thing we did is we um, signed up to be part of an international student satisfaction survey, I barometer. We're now in our third year of it. Um, to find out from the students, you know, to assess the students and its benchmarks across institutions in the United States and abroad, which are also our competitors for international students. And we learned some really good information <coughs> from this. For instance, now we do an airport pickup both in Chicago and in Milwaukee, and it makes a big deal, really a big difference for students to feel that they're really being welcomed. Our, our, our chancellor has the chancellor's ice cream social that we do. He's out there scooping ice cream. We're trying everything to make them feel like part of our community. Um, but I would say more than that, we, we also, about three years ago, two and a half years ago, brought a consultant to campus to help us talk about campus climate for international students. Um, she's a professor at the University of Arizona, and it was really interesting because what she told us, and I think this is be interesting for the regents and for other people here, because we were concerned, how do we make sure that international students are, are getting the education that they're paying for? I've heard from international uh, scholars and faculty members, many of whom are my colleagues, who said when they were an international student here studying in the United States, they had no American friends, um, that it was very, very divided. And so we thought it was important to bring in a consultant to give us other ideas we may not be aware of, of how, what more we could be doing. And what her report revealed was this, that the best way to internationalize, to make your campus friendly for international students is to internationalize your domestic students. One of the things I, was, I talked to you, this, the Board of Regents, about three years ago about our Global Studies program. Uh, this began in 2000. Um, it is a really, a, the initial idea was for a degree in global management. I think there was a real keen sense that the business school understood that business education could not be local. Um, so the Global Studies degree has grown to be a partnership between various schools and colleges across campuses. It's a pre-professional degree, bringing the best of the professional schools together with the very best in the liberal arts. Students are required to take eight semesters of a foreign language and strongly encouraged to take a less commonly taught language. In other words, not just Spanish, French, and German. Um, they are required to study abroad for a semester. They are required to do an internship abroad. Um, they produce a portfolio. Th these students, the, the Global Studies program has five tracks currently. Global Management with a School of Business, Global Communication with various partners, uh, Global Security, uh, Global Sustainability. We're currently working on a global, uh, we have Global Urban Development with the School of Architecture and Urban Planning, and we're currently working on a Global Health um, with, in collaboration with the School of Nursing, uh, Health Sciences, and Public Health. So, what I'm trying to say is we're really trying to address this in a holistic way. Uh, we, we, I think we've made huge progress um, in, in this regard, and I think that really the goal for all of our students is to have a truly, I think Ray Cross said at the beginning, have a truly global education. International students aren't there just as wallpaper for the domestic students to soak in their culture. We need much more of a sense of interaction, and I think even if we have students who can't study abroad for the reasons you discussed, or our students who um, we want our students to have that international experience with their peers in various programs, through academic programs, through co-curricular programs, even when they're on our campus. I've said enough. Jennifer's going to just talk briefly about the international student experience. Question? Oh, yes. Uh, a couple of years ago, excuse me, a couple of years ago we approved, uh, I think through the Education Committee, uh, a deep um, immersion Chinese English with the eye toward Chinese student visiting, get them deep dive in English, maybe they'll stay for the degree. Is that unfolded positively? I, I, our largest cohort of students, which I'm sure is true for others, do come from China. The program that you approved several years ago, we worked very hard on that program, but in the end, our partners really wanted to develop a high school program. Their model was a, uh, a standalone facility where these students would be housed, which is much more appropriate for high school students, and that's the way that that developed. At the same time, we have, as you described, and I'm sure by other we have numerous partnerships. We've really worked very hard in the last two years in ramping up our partnerships. We're also working with ages, um, and Jennifer could talk a little bit more about that. Um, so we're, and as I said, we've had tremendous growth in the numbers of students from China, from India, from <coughs> South Korea, um, Brazil. We have a large contingent of Saudi students. Um, Just a brief follow-up. Mm -hmm. um, 
as to your campus and, and to River Falls um, with a sensitivity toward the realities of travel, cost, savings, and then in UW approved missions, our brand goes and ultimately the accountability comes back to this table if something goes crooked. Are we using uh, the approved uh, university travel programs uh, on your campuses? We've been 100% compliant since last year. Um, well, my understanding from our auditors that that's not the case in, um, in, a, in a number of the campuses, and I would hope that um, as to the chancellors that um, um, might be here, uh, help us nudge to make sure that we've got the appropriate standards for travel in place rather than freelancing. Right. One thing I could say to that, when, when I um, was asked to take um, on the job of being director of what was then the Center for International Studies in 1999, um, on the UWM campus, we had various units scattered across the campus. And for instance, just the way the institution grew, our study, we had, there was a study abroad office in the College of Letters and Science, and then there was another study abroad office in the graduate school. Why? Because, of course, historically, the College of Letters and Sciences who sent people abroad. But as the professional schools, some professional schools became more interested. LNS wasn't going to run, run their program. So on our campus, that would always go to the graduate school as the kind of holding place. Um, in any event, when I came in, and Nancy Zimfer had, was, had just finished the strategic plan, and she said she wanted me to bring all international units together. And what we found, so we brought two competing study abroad offices together, and also establish risk management and other kinds of uh, criteria because individual faculty, some schools, it was, it was the Wild West out there. We have a mega center at UWM. So we, everything international is under the purview of the Center for International, that's research programs, that's academic programs, study abroad, international students. So all the international professionals are working with each other and learn, so I, that's how we've been able to do it. One of the concerns, of course, is you know, if individual schools and colleges or even departments start to, as probably they were doing in the 60s, the, the risk management aspect of this is, is very concerning. I mean, people are well-meaning, but they don't um, really understand the standards in the field. So well, let me turn to Jennifer, unless you have another question. Thank you. Yep. Do you want to take a seat? I can just stand. Okay. okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm Jennifer Grinnell, Director of International Student Scholar Services. We're one of the units in the Center for International Education. And I, I was going to talk briefly about the international student experience. Um, first thing I'd like to say, I'm looking at this, the state of Wisconsin over there. And that, that shape is not recognizable around the rest of the world. People don't know Wisconsin. Um, it's like us looking at the map of China and identifying a province. They don't know that state. We're a flyover state. And we work really hard to try and promote Wisconsin as a great destination for higher education. I work very closely with the other directors in the system, and we collaborate a lot. We try and bring students to the state. We know there's a lot of international student mobility within the state of Wisconsin, which we're really proud of. Our campuses offer different programs, undergraduate and graduate degrees. And so we also know that once students get here, and once they start to recognize this shape of our state, um, they really like it. International students are very pleasantly surprised. They know New York. They know Los Angeles. They know Texas. Um, most know Chicago, so we're lucky we can say we're just north of Chicago. So I think students generally have a really positive experience. What, one thing that I wanted to talk about is, is all students are here for their academic success and, and to achieve great things and study in another country. But that an experience that students have that is kind of invisible, and that's what all the international student services offices deal with, is one of compliance. And I just thought the timing was kind of interesting just to share a little bit about that with you. Um, Dr. Delgado mentioned our students getting a passport for the first time, going through customs, all of the challenges of getting to another country. Our students are doing this right now. They the have, international students. The international students. They have applied to UWM or UW-Madison or UW-River Falls or Platteville. And they have gone through a tremendous amount of work to get their transcripts here, to have things translated, to demonstrate language proficiency, to take all the required tests. First hurdle, then they get admitted. Then they have to show a rather sizable bank account to be able to get um, the visa document they, that they need issued from our university to apply for a visa. Um, and then, 
So they have all of this done, they have the document, and then there's a big stress of going and applying for a visa. That's what they're all doing right now, all the new students. Um, they can't enter the country before 30 days, um, 30 days before the school starts. So right now, all the visa applications are happening, and this can be very stressful. So then they get their visa, they get to the U.S., they go through the port of entry. Many of us have been through port of entry. Sometimes it goes smoothly, sometimes it's rather stressful, and our students face that. They get to the U.S., all of a sudden they are functioning completely, oftentimes in another language, in a completely different academic environment. Their expectations of what the classroom culture will be like might be very different. Their expectations of getting the kind of food they need might be very different. Um, they, they, they are kind of in a, a state of shock. But one thing, in order to be successful academically, there's so much that they have to understand about compliance to maintain their visa status. And um, that's where our, our worlds connect. Our universities, I can speak on behalf of all of our universities, we um, have to report their registration to the federal government. We have to report their address. There's all these, these terms students learn, the I-20, the I-94, the I-765, the OPT, the CPT, all of these, this language that's just unique to international students and rules and regulations that they have to follow so that they can be successful. Um, part of being successful, uh, Patrice mentioned, is really feeling integrated into the campus community. And I want to say one thing that, that UWM, as our, as our numbers have grown, we've been really um, fortunate, and I'm sure the other schools are experiencing the same thing. Historically, international students were taken care of by the international office, and they're sort of over there. But I think our university and, and, and other schools are seeing our international students as UWM students first, or UWM Madison students first. And they're really part of the campus community. And this aspect of being an international student and the unique needs they have is really important. It's really important that we serve them. It's important that they understand what they are so they can really accomplish what they're here for. Now, lastly, just before I close, I just wanted to, to reiterate a couple things that were said. Right now, it's really a competitive market. Wisconsin isn't the only, only state looking at international students. Um, the entire U.S. Is, is working really hard to attract students to come to the U.S. Other countries are too. Canada, um, New Zealand, Australia, they're changing their employment laws so international students would be more likely to want to come to their countries because there's a lot, as you've seen, there's a lot of revenue that comes in um, as a result of international students in, in, in addition to all the other benefits of having an international population on campus. So it's highly competitive. We work really hard. We're trying to promote the state, and we want students to have a pleasant experience. Thank you. Question. Yes. Uh, to Patrice, and maybe the two of you. Yeah, sure. You mentioned about the uh, experience and the interest in the high schools. As a matter of fact, I happen to drive past quite regularly the hotel in Wauwatosa that has over 160 Chinese high schoolers and they're going to six um, high schools in the Milwaukee metro area. What, if any, contacts are, are being uh, held with them? Uh, and the reason I'm, I'm asking is because uh, they're here. They're going to be here for their four years in high school. Uh, you talk about an economic impact. Uh, it's, I've seen them several times as a group going over to the local walking distance target uh, department store, and they're coming out with bagfuls of... Uh, things that they're buying, so even at the high school level, there's an economic impact. Um, I understand that Barron County and Kathy, uh, I'm dealing with the UW, UW Barron County has a, uh, a relationship with a private school where they're getting an associate degree uh, simultaneously to graduating from high school. Is that a potential other way of recruiting uh, international students that are already in the country as opposed to waiting until they graduate from high school and, or their equivalent of high school and then coming here. Uh, language is no longer going to be a major problem. Uh, the anxiety that you mentioned is probably long gone because they've been already here through high school. Uh, what can you t tell us about that? Uh, I can say one thing that I think as far as um, uh, the, the Chinese high school program, um, you know, they're, they're, they're going to parochial and private schools. Right. And I think that what they're selling to the parents is not that they're going to go to UWM or UW-Madison. I think yep, they're probably Princeton, yep. Stanford, and Yale. Okay, so that, I think that, and hence the huge investment in some of those parents moving over with their family, with their children, 
Um, however, what you put, just pointed out, we know that there are a lot of international students, not just in the state of Wisconsin, but in other states that are attending high school or in other programs. And in fact, Jennifer could say a little bit about what we're doing to kind of work with community colleges. But yeah. go. Absolutely. First of all, um, with Tim Urbana and, and UW colleges, um, we connect with the, with the other UW colleges that have international students to make sure they're aware of how to come to UW. And then some of us have gone and visited some of those colleges to invite the students. There are a number of um, community colleges in the Chicago area um, that we have tried to recruit students. And also, the Pacific West, the Pacific Northwest, um, has a huge number of, of two-year colleges that bring in thousands of international students. And uh, they have recruitment fairs for schools like ours to go and meet with the students. And they also have a um, possibility, which we haven't ventured into yet, but we're thinking about it, some articulation agreements that show, you know, you complete this, and the next step can be coming to UW. So you're right. And then the, the private high schools, this is new in the last five years. And um, we have gone to the, to the um, one living facility in, um, near Wauwatosa, uh, yeah, near there. And they've had a fair for most of the Wisconsin schools, public and the private um, have been there to recruit. I, I just think that to me it's interesting, the, the old concept of a high schooler going to somebody's house and living there for a year or whatever. Uh, here you're talking about a hundred, over 160 high schoolers in a hotel. It's an interesting concept. <laughs> We have, we have two more speakers, and I'm, I'm looking at the clock, so. It's hard here. <laughs> well, um, Cynthia Williams of UW Madison, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I just wanted to just quickly point out to you that you do have a handout that has a lot of information about UW Madison um, international programs. And I was going to go through and highlight some of those, but I think in the interest of time, I'll just very briefly mention a couple of things, and then I'll turn it over to our vice provost, who's going to tell you a little bit about how, why these uh, areas are so important um, in terms of the global engagement of UW-Madison. Um, we are uh, in the top 10, have been for a long time in study abroad. 25% of a graduating class goes abroad before they graduate. Um, in terms of international students, I think uh, the, the main thing that's um, really of interest here is that we do have uh, a much larger um, percentage-wise number of international graduate students than we do undergraduate students. Um, and those are drawn from um, undergraduate and graduate from a total of 15,000 um, applications a year. Um, so we do have a robust um, uh, number of international students at Madison. Um, and in terms of global engagement and agreement, the Madison campus has 200 agreements with institutions abroad they, that come through our office. About half of those are for student exchange, where a student from Madison goes abroad and a student from that institution comes here. And the others are all faculty related in some way to our research. So I'd be happy to answer questions afterwards, but I think I will turn it over yeah. to Guido and let him tell you a little bit more about our one. So I'm going to be brief and just not to repeat what Fernando, Patrice, and Cynthia have said. And actually calling your attention about just some features. In general, we are extremely pleased with what's going on with the study abroad. The numbers are increasing. More women are taking part of the study abroad programs. Actually, in our case, the ratio it has been reversed, and now we have more women than men going to study abroad. And then we have also more students in the sciences going to, into a study abroad program, which is a new thing. But at the same time, it's very important to keep in mind that the study abroad is not what it used to be. Not now service, service learning components are extremely important. Internships are also extremely important. And just going back to your question before, safety and security issues are becoming an issue, a very important issue. The, at the start of the presentation, Stephen made the point about the imbalance that there are in relation to students, too many students, or a significant number of the students going to Europe and not going to other places. That's a very complex situation. We, every, all, all, I think all of us are trying to deal with the issues. 
but you know also why the students are not going to Africa, why the students are not going to the Middle East, and why the students are not going to Mexico, just to give you a few examples. So we need to deal with these issues, not to be trapped in what, what are the, the, the kind of issues that impede the students from going abroad. One very important issue also is financial aid. You know, if we want really to make a difference in terms of the number of the students going abroad, we will need to do something about it. Because otherwise we will have a significant number of the students who will not be in a position to go, not only because they need to work during the academic year at the, in the evening or during the summer, because it's a huge investment. The study abroad is not how it used to be. Now it's much more expensive. Then I would like just to call to your attention about a few things that are important, particularly in relation to UW Madison. We have a significant area, number of area studies programs that are federally funded. That's a very unique instrument that has allowed us to fund language instruction. And as you very well know, that's pretty much at stake right now in terms of how the federal government is looking into providing this kind of funding through the, school, the U.S. Department of Education. So I think it's going to be very important to follow this news and to do whatever you can. I'm talking about you as a group of regions, you know, really to make a difference in, in relation to the debate about what should be the role of the federal government in relation to these policies and how the money should be used. We talk about the number of uh, programs and, and about a, few, a significant number of languages taught here at UW Madison, and sometimes the discussion is limited just to what, why this number of languages. But I would, you know, very often I return the question, if it's not public university like UW Madison, who is going to do it? No? And so in that sense, there is a responsibility. It doesn't mean that we need to keep the same number of languages. But I think there is a role for public universities across the nation, in particular in Wisconsin, given how much the economy is changing, not only within our state, but also abroad. One more thing that I would like to, two more points that I would like to make is, one, that we are actively involved and heavily involved with federally funded programs, like Project GO, which is a program coming from the Department of Defense, who have really been great in terms of providing funding to students who are interested to pursue languages that are not probably the largest enrolled kind of languages, but are extremely important because these are probably the large, large in the sense that how many people are spoken that language. I'm talking about Hindi and Urdu and Pashtun, just to name a, a few. The last thing that I will say is that there is really a very unique opportunity for our system, and in particular for Madison. And it goes back to the discussion we were having about the Wisconsin idea. Many universities, several, the opposite of what's going on here in the U.S. and in Europe is happening in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, where you have an explosion of institutions in higher education. And they are trying to reach out for us to be really, to guide them in the process of building up their higher education infrastructure, and sometimes building university from the scratch. And we see that as a huge and unique opportunity for us to play a role, given the long history the, the, the UW system has in relation to how to do a first rate, a first rank UW state system, and in particular has to do with the ranking and the prestige of the UW. That's all I would say. Thanks. Question. I'm sorry. Um, international students this past year, degrees, degrees granted from how many countries? I think we have the same problem, not problem, the same data. No? The 70% of our undergraduate students come from one country. 50% of our graduate students come from the same country. So in that sense, it's, uh, the issue remains about how to do in order to be to be attractive to other uh, students coming from other places. In the national press, I saw one of the systems put out a, an announcement of across the campuses, the large number of countries represented in the student body. And I would suspect that we have that here, Becky, but we were talking earlier about public relations and people increasingly understanding our efficacy right. in, the, in, in, in the global conversation. And, do we put those data out? And if we don't, shouldn't we? 
we, they're, they're available on Data Digest. I often talk about them yeah. when I talk about our incoming class. But um, it, it would be it, of great interest yeah. to our editorial boards around in our yeah. in our communities. Let me let me tell you add one more thing in relation to this issue, and I'm sorry if I'm taking too much time. But it has to do with the 14,000 uh, alumni we have. You need to see how to translate that. That should be translating into opportunities for our students for internships abroad and all kind of venues that are actually open thanks to the strong connection the university has with this large group of people abroad. And I'm sorry, any time I will be more than happy to come back and be more in detail about this issue. Hi, I'm Brian, and I brought pictures. <laughs> <laughs> On a more formal note, um, my name is Brian Rivers. I'm a senior civil engineering student at the University of Wisconsin Platteville, and I'm here today to uh, really just tell you guys more about, uh, more, uh, give you an illustration of the importance of education abroad from the student perspective. Uh, with my work uh, with the organization Engineers Without Borders. Maybe not. There we are. Yep. Okay. Um, I know we are running on a short schedule, so I'll uh, be brief. Uh, so Engineers Without Borders, if you've never really, if you're not familiar with the organization, I tell people to imagine uh, Habitat for Humanities work and Doctors Without Borders and pretty much combine the two and you have Engineers Without Borders. So uh, like I said, we're an international nonprofit humanitarian organization and we partner with the Education Abroad Office um, at Platteville to give students um, not only the education side of um, more of like not to give them more of the educational side, but more of a project-based side. Um, and certainly, we've been working uh, primarily in Ghana, uh, which is in West Africa, uh, for the last uh, eight years here. Um, we were founded by Dr. Samuel Usu Ababio. Uh, he is native to uh, Ghana himself and really just saw a need for uh, engineering students in the United <laughs> States to have a, a potential impact uh, on, a, on impoverished communities around the world while they're studying. And a few of the previous projects that we've done, uh, as you can see here, uh, we work mainly with infrastructure. So we implement things like culverts and bridges. And our current project right now is a school. Uh, it's the NAVA Primary School. And NAVA is a acronym for the four beneficiary communities um, that we will be, that we are building for. And certainly it's an elementary school for 250 children. And uh, it's a four, uh, four building complex. Uh, as you can see there, it's kind of a computer model of what the uh, complex will look like when it opens. And we are getting very close to its completion. Um, briefly, I'll just kind of take you through some of the phases of the project because it really illustrates um, how my education in civil engineering was really just put to the test in the field while I'm learning and inter how international education really brought that about. Um, so phase one was really just clearing out the site, grading it. Uh, digging out the foundations and the footings and pouring the floor slabs. And that was the very first trip that I went on as a sophomore. Um, phase two was a little more uh, intricate. We had, we started building up the masonry walls because it's a uh, masonry, uh, masonry concrete and timber structure. And so obviously we added 10 courses of uh, masonry with a bond beam across the top. And so one kind of cool thing I'll mention about the bond beam on the top was that that was actually uh, a relatively new piece of technology that we were able to introduce to the local community there. And so um, really the goal with Engineers Without Borders is to not only uh, work with the community or drop off a school and leave, you know, we, we educate the community, we work with them, they help provide the labor, and in a sense they, we get education, they get education, and they have a sense of ownership in the project as well. So by implementing that new bond beam, um, I'm happy to report that the Masons in that local area actually used that new piece of technology that we were able to deliver to them. So, And uh, last August, I was a, had the privilege of being the project lead over there. And so we uh, finished phase two and moved on to phase three, our roofing system, which is a uh, uh, pretty much a, just kind of a think trust there. Um, essentially, we <laughs> actually changed the design because it was very hard to lift up. But as you can see, we constructed on the floor, flipped it up to the top, um, had our local uh, villagers and community members help us do that. And so thus, 
this is, oops, sorry, that wasn't supposed to be in there, but it's more of an in-depth look at our uh, site issues and stuff. Um, and this is what our finished product came to be. So um, this was my travel team from the University of Wisconsin Platteville. All of the pictures you've seen here today were construction projects by Platteville students uh, participating in international education. So if anything, this presentation really is just an illustration of you know, how in-depth and how valuable that international education can be. Okay, uh, I certainly have a slide for any questions. Uh, you, when you're on the other side of the world, we take some time to just uh, travel as well and see the sites, and that was a, one of my favorites. So, um, I guess maybe I'll, I'll just touch briefly on more of the importance of, of education abroad, and it has kind of really identified three, three main areas of, of personal growth, and the first and foremost being academic. You know, uh, when I traveled my first time, I didn't know a lick of civil engineering. By the time I came back, I, I, I had such a moral wealth of knowledge of, you know, what my education was doing and what it meant, and it really provided a foundation for everything I learned afterwards. When I traveled the second time, I was like, oh, that stuff that I learned in structural engineering now actually makes sense. So we were able to, yeah. It, <laughs> well, I mean, not all, not all the way yet, but you know, we're, it's, it's a progress. But uh, no, but seriously, I mean, and that's the thing is that. You know, when you travel and you, you work with the community and you work on a project, um, you know, you, you get to translate that, that theoretical knowledge into work in the field and actually benefit the local community there. Um, the second uh, area for growth is professional. Um, when we travel uh, with Engineers Without Borders, uh, we're traveling with professional engineers and we um, really get a good chance to network with these engineers and they provide us with, you know, knowledge and, uh, you know, well, you actually shouldn't have built the building that way or, you know, something like that. But really, they just provide an extra, an extra piece of networking for us when we get out into the work field. So the third is really just personal, uh, the personal empowerment of, you know, traveling abroad and getting that cultural experience. Um, honestly, I think somebody said, you know, the best way to internationalize or internationalize your campus to internationalize your local, your local students. And honestly, I, I can really say that, that that's true because when you go abroad and you see the conditions and the, the, the things that people have to live with across the world, um, that really puts it in perspective when you come back because I can certainly say that um, one of my best friends at Platteville, he's from Burkina Faso, which is just north of Ghana. And I didn't start that friendship with him until I came back and I'm like, wow, like that's, it's really awesome that you, you made it here all the way from Burkina. And you know, I think that that's, gives you some perspective at, at the very minimal. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a really great opportunity to take what you've learned in the classroom, apply it, and come back uh, with a wider and deeper breadth of knowledge. So, any questions? Yeah, thanks for having me. a lot when we hear from our students. We love you as the professors, but <laughs> hearing from students and then um, hearing how that translated once you came back home yeah. and building relationships right here in yeah. our country. Um, so kudos. A question, are there any diversity goals in our international programs as far as those students that are on our campuses that have an opportunity to participate in going abroad? Absolutely. At UWM, since 2005, we had a task force. We had various, we were, I'll tell you this, this is a true story. Men, if around, I don't know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I was talking to the then provost who told me, oh, study abroad. That's finishing school for white women. And I was really taken aback. I, I, <laughs> uh, and I've been an international student several times myself. And I said, well, you know, don't, don't uh, uh, criticize your core constituency. Why don't we ask the other question? Why aren't more white men studying abroad? Why aren't more students of color studying abroad? What are the what are the obstacles? What are the stumbling blocks? And so we with a group we started out with a group of faculty, trying to was it where the destinations weren't interesting? Was it that they weren't compelling? That it didn't really work with their degree program? I mean, costs. What can we do about costs to get the first generation, especially students of color, to study abroad? And um, after many, many webinars and meetings, you know, we learned you don't just talk to, uh, you need to really talk to the front end advisors because a lot of kids don't think that it's possible. We have an array like everybody else does. We have short term, we have long, semester long, year long programs. 
one of the things that we've tried to do, and I'm going to just say it again, it never, maybe somebody here will like this idea. One of the things we, we've been trying to do this for years, we want to do a study abroad savings account, which is where students, usually it's like 75% of students say they want to study abroad when they go to college. And then, you know, 2% nationally do. Really great work at Madison. Um, and for all the reasons, cost, jobs, family. So what we thought was if we could get students to put $10 a week or $5 a week into a, a savings account and set it up with UW Credit Union. And then in their junior year, we could work with donors to say, would you match what they say? Would you match the amount? And that way make it possible if they, if the students have a stake in the game because they've got money saved for this purpose. You'd think some donors would be really thrilled to say, I want to help these students make this goal. Um, so we've been trying a lot of, and for me personally, it's one of my major goals. I mean, some of our colleagues, my, uh, my colleagues have said, well, you have to understand, Patrice, you know, some of these kids are in the inner city. They, can't, they haven't even been to the lakefront. And I said, well, let them go to another lakefront, and they come back and, can't, and conquer this one. Um, so we're working on it, and I'm sure others are too. Yeah, if I may. Um, one of the things we work with engineers about board is, is emphasizing that you don't actually have to be an engineer to travel and that, um, you know, there's obviously the education abroad experience. You know, you go, you spend a semester abroad, but also offering um, this side of like an NGO or a nonprofit organization gives you other options too. You know, if you don't want to do education, you can focus on projects. If you don't want to go for a whole semester, you can go for four weeks, you know, and, and those things. And certainly, um, you know, setting up a bank account, setting up better funding options for either the educational side or the, you know, even the nonprofit side, which we're kind of developing at, at Platteville. Um, would be so much more beneficial. I mean, sometimes we struggle to get people to travel just because it, it costs so much. But uh, certainly there are widening the array of options is, is good. I mean, one tool that we use for many of our students of color is the National Student Exchange. So we, we see a growing number of, of Latino and African American students. Um, and they've always been the minority student. And so we have particular partnerships with HSI, Hispanic Serving Institutions and HBCUs. Um, the most notable one is probably Virginia Tech, excuse me, Virginia State. And so we've worked with them so that they can send their students through our study abroad programs. But by the same token, we're sending some of our African American students there to give them that first taste away. Because developmentally, that's the big issue, right? It, it, it's, you know, how far away is a separate issue, but just being away from your community, from your family, is the first developmental hurdle. Um, and they're very intrigued by being a majority student in that kind of environment and experiencing that probably for the first time in their life, and certainly in higher education. And I think that's, that has really helped inform how we see our approach, the pitch we make to our students of color. Yeah, I've worked with um, developing a student abroad program. Actually, with my work with Thurgood Marshall College Fund, and it was primarily African American students, China, Africa, and you know there were a lot of support mechanisms that we put in place also in preparation. But you know, I just it's critical that we make sure that there's inclusion in all these wonderful opportunities. Absolutely, you know how life changing it is. So Thank it's, you. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much. Stephen, did you want to tie things up for us? Yes, Thank you. I know we we are about ten minutes past the time. So I do have some acknowledgments, uh, especially for the panel and my colleagues uh, here at UW System Administration as well as my colleagues across the system, the, the international directors. But this is what I want to do. Uh, the, the bottom line is, why is this important? Why are we engaged in this work? And I think the way I want to do this is just to ask the regions to, to imagine something. I just want you to imagine this scenario. And I want you to follow me uh, in your imagination just for about two minutes. Imagine that you are the vice president of a global for global operations for a Fortune 500 co company. It is 6.30 a.m. on Wednesday. You are just finishing your breakfast in, at a restaurant in Monrovia, the capital city of the Republic of Liberia, a country on the west coast of Africa that is recovering from more than 20 years of civil war and recent Ebola crisis. 
You have been in Liberia for a week negotiating a contract for your country to build the next generation of hydroelectric power plants. The contract is worth millions and you have been successful. This means jobs for people both in Liberia and people in the United States. Congratulations. After your breakfast, you head to Rabos International Airport, which is only about 35 miles outside the capital. You are headed home. It is now 9 a.m. GMT, and you board the Boeing 747 jet airliner operated by British Airways. Let me offer you a first-class seat. Your plane is clear for takeoff, and you are on a direct flight from Rabos International Airport to London Heathrow. It is a good flight. In six and a half hours later, you arrive in Heathrow. It is now 3.30 p.m. GMT. At Heathrow, you have only a brief time to get a little snack before heading to your connecting flight. You board United Airlines for a non-stop flight to London, from London Heathrow to Chicago O'Hare. I'm offering you a seat in business first. It is now 6 p.m. GMT and you are airborne. Your plane, a Boeing 777, quickly reaches 36,000 feet and you are cruising at a speed of about 500 to 550 miles per hour. It is a smooth flight. About eight hours later, you arrive in Chicago. It is 9 p.m. Central Time. There is a ride waiting for you outside the baggage claim to take you home. By 11 p.m., you are home and your chicken dinner is waiting for you. <laughs> Obviously, it is too late for a heavy meal, but you know better. You have been away for a week and your spouse has prepared a meal for you. Either you, either you get a taste of the food or be prepared to sleep on the couch for the next two weeks. <laughs> so you get a taste of the food, you take a quick shower, and head to bed. Tomorrow afternoon, you have a meeting to brief the senior leadership and the board directors about your negotiations in Liberia. Just before closing your eyes, you reflect on your day, briefly. You have traveled about 7,000 miles, had something to eat on three different continents, all within less than 24 hours. You reflect on how interconnected countries have become. And you say to your spouse, honey, the world is becoming a smaller place each day. What did you say? She replies. She's almost halfway asleep. Never mind, honey. You reply. Good night. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the world our students are inheriting. A world in which travel and technology can allow us to work with people at great distances. A decision made in one part of the world could have rewards or consequences for millions of people in other parts of the world. We know about Greece this week, we know about China this week. This is the kind of war for which we must prepare our students not just to compete in, but to be leaders. We must prepare them to be able to engage anywhere in the world and be successful. They need to be able, they need to be culturally competent in order to be successful. We must prepare our students to be global leaders. To me, this is the importance of preparing our students for international <coughs> education. So thank you very much. If you don't have any questions, I think we'll conclude. Again, thanks to the panel. Can you join me in thanking them? to all our presenters. This is an important program and it is, uh, and it is very beneficial for our students. As you know, we have not only our four-year campuses, but our two-year campuses are experimenting with both having students coming there and by sending students out. Uh, you may recall that we had originally scheduled a presentation by some of our elected student representatives at our June meeting. Their willingness to join us in July instead. We welcome three.
Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for just granting us quite literally a seat at the table today. May I interrupt you just for a moment? Absolutely. So we can, so we all know who is here. Before you get started, would you mind introducing yourself, telling me where you, telling us where you come from? Absolutely. What what campus? And also uh, giving us what your year is, and let's go through everyone so we just have a, a profile of who you represent. All right. Not a problem. Thank you. Um, my name is Joe Sigworth. Uh, I'm a student at uw Platteville, just like Brian is. Um, so we are proud pioneers. Yes, definitionally, that means we have to go first. That's why I'm sitting here. Um, pioneers means going first. Um, so yeah, uh, Joe Sigworth, I'm a business administration major. I am going to be graduating in May. Woot, woot. Um, so yeah, uh, love it down in Platteville. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Katie Cronmiller, and I am a senior at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Uh, I am a political science and psychology double major, and I have the distinct honor of serving as uh, the president of both the Student Government Association and the student body at our great university. Hi, uh, my name is Graham Pierce. Um, I, uh, I serve as vice chair of UW Systems Student Reps, which is uh, kind of the reason we're here today. I also serve as president of uh, UW College's Student Governance Council um, and also in student government on my own campus. Um, I am uh, in my second year at UW Marshfield, and um, I, will, I, I hope to uh, attend UW Madison when I'm done there to study math and business. Thank you, Grant. Yes. Uh, my name is Ryan Sorensen. I'm currently the chair of UW System Student Representatives. Uh, this past year, I was the student body president at UW Milwaukee. Um, I'm going to be a senior this year, um, political science and history. And I'd like to do a quick shout out. We have some other student leaders here in the audience. Uh, we have Eau Claire here, Platteville, uh, River Falls, Fond du Lac's here. Uh, Whitewater has a huge delegation. Um, yeah, and then Milwaukee. Of course. Could you stand up, Brian? Could you have uh, Jake stand up? Yeah. Sure. Everyone stand up. We can see what Thank you. Appreciate that, Joe. Don't they all look good? Um, they didn't have to dress up. So that's great. Um, anyway, again, uh, I am Joe. Uh, to get you a, a little bit of uh, an introduction, a little background, uh, that, that's what I'm here today for. Um, and just a, a quick note, uh, we'd like to, if possible, just go through uh, everything that we have to say. It shouldn't take too long at all. And then take questions at the end, if that's all right, with the board. Um, so first things first, uh, this is uh, coming up here. This is my fourth year um, in either elected or appointed student leadership. So like I said, I'm a, I'm a senior this fall. Um, I've been working with student reps, working with uh, students for years now. I've uh, served two terms as president. I'm going into my second term as vice president. Um, I served as a member of the student reps, all of that. So I've kind of got all of these different things uh, as far as perspective goes. Um, but I want to I let the board know a little bit about the, uh, the numbers and the trajectory behind what student reps is. Um, so for those of you who don't know, student reps, it was October 5th of 2012 that we were founded. Um, we were founded by uh, a couple of gentlemen uh, who were student body presidents or vice presidents at the time. Um, many of you might know uh, Corey Fish. He was uh, over at UW Eau Claire. He worked for the governor's office. He worked for the Supreme Court here in Wisconsin. Um, so he's a familiar face. Jordan Miller also worked at the Capitol as well, just right over there. So these gentlemen got together because they re realized that students needed an elected voice to represent them on a statewide level. They needed a unified voice to do that. Um, so what they did was they put together, again, uh, on October, October 5th, I believe it was, of 2012, they put together student reps. Um, and what that was was a, a body of all, all students, uh, student leaders uh, from all 26 institutions uh, with the point of representing students across the state. So that's, that's who we are. We're the elected representative leaders. Um, so fast forward then a year later, um, 364 days, October 4th, 2013. This is where I started coming into play. Uh, Jordan Miller was vice president down at UW Platteville. He was the one who got me into student governance. One of those days he just said, hey, freshman, go try this out. You might like it. And so here I am, again, four years later, trying it out. Um, his thought was uh, to, to continue to grow and to build this, and that's exactly what they did a year later. So October of 2013, we have ratified our, our bylaws, and we put together um, a, lot of, a lot of different things, including our executive committee, um, the people who you see in front of you here today. So that was 2013, right? That's when I started really getting involved. But one of the things that we struggled with, as, as I'm sure you understand, 
and unless you actually do something, people aren't going to buy into your idea. Unless you actually prove that you're, that you're worth something, that you're worth your salt, people aren't going to show up. They're not going to come to meetings. And that's what student reps struggled with for quite a while. Um, our quorum was just a simple majority of all the campuses, so 14 members had to be present for us to conduct our business. And that's one thing that we struggled with, was getting those 14 campuses to show up. I remember, I remember sitting in a meeting you know, here in, in, Milwaukee, in Milwaukee or in Madison and saying, hey, you know, we've got to call some people in for a conference call to, to get them to buy in. Um, but something, something that's kind of amazing has happened in the last two years that I've worked um, specifically on reps. Um, People have started showing up. This last year, we, uh, all spring, we didn't have a, a meeting where there were less than 22 of the 26 campuses there. Uh, people were showing up. We ran nine separate different campaigns uh, across the state, everything from veterans accreditation to uh, a better UW uh, initiative. Uh, some of you may have heard of that in, in collaborating with us. Um, the Better UW initiative was something that uh, we put together in reaction to the governor's budget when that was released because we as students saw that there were, based on our budget priorities that we put together last fall, we saw that there were needs, right? So of these nine different campaigns, of these, you know, 22, we actually had 25 of the 26 campuses represented all of last year um, at all of our student reps meetings, right? So again, these elected government officials, or not government officials, student government <laughs> officials, I want to be very clear there, student government officials actually were coming together and they were proving that they were worth their salt, right? They were releasing all of these different campaigns. Um, and that's what we want to continue to do moving forward. Um, so as you can see, in the last three years, we've had this, this upward trajectory. We've been building steam. And that, again, is why we're here today, to continue building that steam, to continue having student representation, and to continue having student reps here, having a voice, having a part, and quite honestly, just doing things for students, 180,000 of us across the state. So that's my bit. Katie? <laughs> All right, uh, so while I am not a pioneer, I am a pointer. And at points, we do the hard work. So, <laughs> today, I have been charged. The <laughs> thing is, there is there's a structure to this. <laughs> so today, I have been charged with convincing all of you of the importance of student-shared governance, its effectiveness, and how it plays a very integral role in our system. In four minutes, a really simple task. So... I started and deleted what I wanted to say at least a dozen times, trying to think of what stories, what accomplishments, and what student successes would be most impressive to all of you. But more and more, I started to realize just how difficult it would be to limit those successes. Because every time I have met with the shared governance leaders from around the state, I have been overwhelmed by the passion they have, not only for their individual campuses and students, but also for this entire UW system and the 180,000 students attending one of our 26 campuses. Through shared governance, students become leaders. We learn to work in teams, we learn to problem solve. We find creative and innovative solutions to our campus's problems that administrators, faculty, and staff don't think of because they've become accustomed to the system. We get to challenge the status quo. We work tirelessly for the students we represent, and we do it because we are students. We have a vested interest in the success of our universities, of our degree, and of this system. We hear student concerns in classes and in residence halls. We don't just have to read national reports about them. We hear them in coffee shops around town, and we get to take those ideas, those solutions, and those concerns back to our administrators, back to our faculty and staff, and back to you to work to find solutions together uh, to implement new policies and to create real change on our campuses. Obviously, in the past few months, every campus has been challenged to make hard decisions about what is important, what is necessary to keep, and what will unfortunately have to be cut because of the budget. Throughout this process, students on every campus have been closely involved in these discussions. We sit on budget committees, we're involved in tough decisions, we recognize the hardships our campuses face, and we act as a bridge between our administration and our student body. The UW colleges have created 26 committees and subcommittees to implement budget reductions. Students sit on 10 of those 26. The SGAs at UW-Eau Claire, UW-La Crosse, and UW-Stevens Point just to name a few, <laughs> have been going to Madison repeatedly with our students to talk with our legislators about the need to restore the UW system funding. 
about our needs as students, not just as numbers. In January, members of the student representatives came together to lobby legislators for two days about the role of student shared governance, the segregated fee process, and our need for funding in order to really support the 180,000 students who depend on us. We came together again in April to try and continue that message. On nearly every campus, SGAs have worked with their administrations, their chancellors, their faculty, and their staff to not only educate students and campus personnel about issues related to the state budget and the proposed public authority, but to relay the concerns of students back to our administrators, back to our faculty, and back to our staff so that that could be integrated into those decision-making processes and into those conversations. This is in no way an exhaustive list. It's not even close to what we have been able to accomplish together in just the last semester. Every day, the decisions that we make about campus policy, about segregated fee allocations, and about student organizations impact the lives of 180,000 students, the resources that are available to them, and their college experiences. I can't possibly explain all of the ways in which students are served by being involved in shared governance, or the ways in which students serve each other, our campuses, and this system through shared governance. So instead, I challenge each of you to get to know us. Learn about what we do and why we do it, and learn for yourselves why it is that student governance is so important, not only to us as student representatives, but to this entire system. Thank you. Thank you. Grant. Thank you. Grant. Um, yes. Oh, no, no problem. Um, so, yeah, uh, once again, I'm Graham Pierce, um, and I don't have anything clever to say about my campus. But I'll, I'll leave that for them. Um, I, I do want to circle back uh, kind of to Joe's comments at the beginning uh, and talk a little bit more about student reps um, and what we do and where we'd like to see ourselves in the future. Um, as you, I'm sure you're aware, one of the, the most difficult recurring challenges for student governance is the, uh, the, the, the short terms of office and the sort of natural term limit that comes from graduation. So, so it makes it difficult to build up uh, an, you know, a, a knowledge and institutional memory in that. Um, so that, the, that's kind of part of the purpose that we've seen ourselves in, is to try to mitigate that. Um, our meetings around the state have provided a valuable forum for student leaders to network, to learn from each other, and to share best practices. Um, and that, that happens both informally and through training sessions that we offer, and we would like to expand that in the future as well. Um, this also gives us the opportunity to collaborate on projects. As uh, uh, Joe was mentioning, the, the campaigns, um, we have, we have uh, used that as a forum to express opinions on, on a number of issues, um, not just to the legislature, but uh, to the UW system as well. Um, and uh, it, it, I've really seen for myself how beneficial this has been um, firsthand uh, in promoting, uh, especially an environment where we can collaborate with our administrators, because I think that's not something that, that necessarily comes naturally to a lot of student leaders, and I think that's some, uh, an area that, that is highly valuable for us um, in, in benefiting our institutions. Um, I certainly don't think that as an organization we have arrived at uh, the best possible version of what we can be. Um, as, as Joe was sharing, we've, we have seen tremendous growth in participation and in our own effectiveness over the past few years, um, but there are definitely improvements that we can, we can make in the future. Ideally, we would like to see every one of our 26 campuses participating regularly um, and engaged in, in really helping to shape the future of the organization. Um, we also see many opportunities to work more closely with you um, and, and at the system level to provide student perspective when it's needed, uh, and we would love to have the opportunity to discuss this further with you. Um, I think student perspective could be more effectively integrated into UW system level governance processes, and I think this uh, perspective will be beneficial to everyone involved. Um, I also think that an introduction from student leaders, like what we're doing here today, uh, would probably be a good idea, uh, if, if possible, on a more regular basis, uh, just to maintain this kind of, kind of connection 
across the changes in student leadership that happen pretty regularly. So um, I think there are a lot of future opportunities here. Um, and as the elected representatives of our own institutions, uh, the students we represent have chosen us for the purpose of communicating their interests and perspectives. UW System Student Reps is building a structure that will maintain the integrity of this process going forward and ensure that we continue to represent the ongoing and changing interests of students in the future. Um, I also think there are opportunities here for you to help us accomplish these goals. Uh, I think a lot of this can be accomplished through more communication, and I think this communication needs to go in both directions, um, not just, just from us to you or from, from you to us, but, but both. Um, and I do want to thank the regents uh, who have attended our meetings in the past. Uh, we've really appreciated that connection. Um, and those uh, visits have provided excellent opportunities for student leaders to hear from the regents and to take questions and comments from students. And so I hope we can uh, continue to uh, do that and expand that. So once again, thanks for inviting us here today. And uh, if you have any questions, we would be happy to take them. Well, we'll hold the questions and we'll tell. Thank you, Graham. We'll hold yeah. the questions until we hear from Ryan. Oh, no, I'm just here for the questions. So we'll open the questions now. Ryan, Ryan is just joining right. us to help answer questions. Yeah. All right. But I, I would just like to echo what uh, Graham's word said, too. We really appreciate uh, those who attended our regions uh, this past year um, and in years past, too. So I guess we're open to questions. Yes. Questions. Are there questions? Uh, Jose? I'll start with a, with a comment and then I'll ask the question. The, the comment is that I, I want to at least uh, make you aware that I am very appreciative of the seriousness with, it, with which you take your responsibilities, especially when we have had to deal with segregated fees and uh, the fact that uh, as we have been reminded, and you reminded us again, the transitory nature of you as students leaving, but yet you're making, uh, in a sense, decisions and recommending to us as regions that we take actions that uh, will be felt by students way beyond your uh, you're having uh, made those recommendations, and I, I continue to be impressed with how seriously you deliberate, you consult, and you um, you really uh, are thinking about the future, not just your moment in time at, at your respective campuses. My question is this: um, I think an area that we have struggled with as regions is that we really want to feel that, especially with segregated fees, that there's really a good sense of uh, level of input from students. And so can you speak to that effect? Because um, at times there's a question about, well, only 15% uh, or only you know, less than 20% of the student body has uh, responded to a survey. How can, how can you help us feel that, well, it not be, may not be 50, 60, 70% that that representation is still solid enough that we can move forward with them, with, uh, say, segregated fees. Any, any reaction to that or any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, we, we get this question a lot, too, and this is kind of a situation that we're running into at UW-Milwaukee. A few years ago, we approved, um, well, the, students, the student body voted on uh, getting a new student union. Students overwhelmingly supported that. But that number of students that voted was uh, around 17%. So it wasn't really a representative sample. But I think that is just, um, just a picture of the bigger problems um, in campus and ca campus engagement, too. Um, we would love to see more students get involved um, in the process with segregated fees. But the average student already has a lot on their mind. It's always really hard to communicate to students um, you know, what segregated fees are, what the process is like. So I, I guess it's a, challenging that we're, a challenge that we're always working towards. But some um, of the issues that uh, Graham raised, too, is that, you know, there's that turnover rate. A lot of students are in uh, school for four years, and by the time that they learn the process, they're already walking out the door looking for another job. So I, I guess it's, it's a hard challenge that we're looking to overcome, and we're trying every day, too, to in always get more student engagement. I guess if any of you want to add to that. Yeah, and just to add on to that, um, you know, we would obviously love for uh, the turnout in some of those bigger votes to be 60, 70 percent of students. But right now, the numbers of students that are responding um, isn't that far off from the number of student or the number of citizens in the United States who vote in major elections. Um, so I don't think it's just a problem that is existing on our our campuses. Um, and I, I could be, uh, you know, exaggerating that or hyperbolic, uh, 
<laughs> Maybe <laughs> local elections, like for school board. Local elections, state school elections. Town board, yeah. Um, but, you know, 70% of the, the people in this state don't necessarily vote for their school board representative or for, and so I think it's not just a problem that exists within our campuses. It's, it's a problem that's representative kind of of our state, of our country as a whole. Um, but that's not to say that we aren't talking to more students, at, that more students aren't educated about segregated fees. Um, when we did our last survey for our health and wellness um, building, we would have loved for the turnout of number, the number of students to have voted to be a lot higher, but it was a huge increase from the last time that a survey had been done because we went to every single one of our residence halls. We put on open forums. We had huge amounts of students who at least came and talked with us about it and um, who knew what was going on, who knew the impact, and when we talked to them, everyone was very supportive, but at the end of the day, they didn't go out and put in the vote. And I don't know how we can get students always to move from that, from talking with us and from being supportive to, to putting in that final vote. Um, that's something that we do struggle with, but we know within our, our students that more students seem to know what is going on than the numbers always reveal, and that bothers us. I don't know if you guys have that same feeling of frustration, but but we we do feel it, uh, at least at Stephen's point. And it's like, we need you to, to actually vote and show everybody else how much you care, because we know how much you care. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I want to thank you, because I think you are doing a tremendous amount of work in actually doing that mm -hmm. outreach, educating mm -hmm. Uh, that it's not uh, just a very small group of students that are being made aware, but that you really are trying to educate as many, and, um, and you're absolutely right. Some people will express interest, but not take that extra step. And, uh, and I don't think that we as regions should interpret that as, oh, that means they're not, they would, if they had voted, they would not have voted for it. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think as regions, we have to be cautious that just because we don't have a large number, that doesn't necessarily mean automatically they're silently voting no. Yeah. Just, are, just there other, are there other questions or comments about other areas? Yes. I'll just make a non-solicited comment. Um, first of all, um, I, I certainly value the role that student government plays in our decision making, and I applaud you for your involvement. I really wanted to just ask uh, all of the people around the room, my colleagues, and those sitting here, how many of you were involved in student government when you were in college? I happen to be. Look at that. And the reason I'm saying that is there are things that I learned in student government that I'm going to use every day, uh, cajoling people into positions without having any control of them. <laughs> I just think you're going to really benefit from this experience. And you know, someday you could end up being a region of chance. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm going to weigh in just a little bit because in February of 2013, I did my trip up to, first trip up to UW-Eau Claire, and I had an opportunity to meet with Corey Frisch and, jo uh, and Jordan Miller. And I think that was the embryonic stage of, of what they had brought together at one point, and actually they talked at length to me about this. And there are two things that I'm struck with. First of all, uh, uh, Really, a very compelling and a very excellent presentation. Thank you very much. You're right, hearing from the students is, is an important thing for us to do because actually that's what, what our work is all about. <laughs> uh, secondly, uh, I am impressed by two things. I am impressed with the growth of the organization, but I'm also impressed with the, uh, the type of organization it is. I'm seeing in each one of you, and I'm imagining you're seeing this too, an, a situation where it's not just an aggregate of all students in UW, but you represent students, but you actually represent your individual campuses. So that, Graham, you represent the colleges, which are uh, in 17,000 students in 13 institutions. You represent Stevens Point. We have a pioneer. And, and, and so you bring, you bring your campuses to the table at the same time you bring the needs of all the students to the table. 
So I want to congratulate you on the work that you're doing, and thank you very much. We very much appreciate having you here. And by the way, thanks to our good friend Tim Higgins. I see you all have your campus pins on, but I am actually going to share with you, uh, I'll pass it down, and share with you a UW Systems pin. And since uh, you're representing your campuses, but you're also representing the system, I hope you will, will consider wearing that as well. So thank you very much for coming. Are there any communications, petitions, or memorials for the Regents this month? All right, hearing now, I'll call upon Regent Bailing to present a motion to move into closed session. Regent Bailing? I move that the Board of Regents...